And I'll start with the main hypothesis of this model, which is that there are three agents in the, in the human brain. They're different but interconnected subagents. Animals only have two of these agents, and the third agent was added in humans, and that's the agent that caused the living problem that I talked about before. In fact, the thinker is the first agent I'll talk about, and it is that third agent that evolved in humans. Now, the thinker uses the brain's executive function, which uses language, symbols, concepts, and images to solve problems. It's the problem solver. And this was the new, more powerful agent, and it's very comfortable working in the world of, world of concepts. It manipulates concepts like bread and butter. The doer is the ancient one that we share with animals, and it's the agent that actually controls the body, and it also has emotions. So emotions come from the, the doer, and the doer also has fine control over the entire body. The most compelling evidence for these two agents is dual process theory in, in, in psychology. Now, dual process theory names their two agents, system one and system two, and I basically just renamed, the be, renamed them to be doer and thinker. So system one corresponds to the doer, and system two is the thinker. Dual process theory was popularized by Daniel Kahneman in his 2011 book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And in this book, he mostly talked about the biases that the doer can have. The doer is the ancient system, but it doesn't really understand concepts as well as the thinker does. So for example, the concept of probability is something the doer can't really understand and give you the correct answer about probability questions. But the thinker, if it thinks about it, can. The problem is modern humans are lazy and they rely on the doer for a lot of their answers when they should be using their thinker instead. So the way they, de the way they demonstrate this is by giving some undergraduate students a test, a psychology test, with a number of questions that have multiple choice answers. The doer will give you the incorrect answer and the thinker will give you the correct answer. And so they can see how many people were using their doer versus how many people were using their thinker to, to um, answer those questions. Another book that popularized this theory is Blink, The Power of, of Thinking Without Thinking. And in this book, Malcolm Gladwell extols the merits of the doer. It turns out that the doer can sometimes come up with the right answer on a hunch. And it turns out after you do a lot of, ex a lot of research with your thinker, it was the right answer. But the, but the doer can come up with it quickly. So sometimes the, the doer is better than the thinker. Now the third agent is required by the good regulator theorem. We've got the thinker and doer and they need to have a model of the world. And my hypothesis is that the, it's the experiencer that constructs and supplies the combined sensory and conceptual models of the world to the thinker and the doer. This is required since both the thinker and doer agents can access both the sensory and conceptual world models. For example, a lot of people can think in images, so they can imagine an image here and rotate it around and see how it connects to this image here. That's thinking in images. You're obviously using your sensory system to do that. So the thinker can do visual things in this, using the sensory system. At the same time, the doer can answer conceptual questions, sometimes wrongly, but it can come up with the answer. That's what the psychology students were doing in dual process theory experiments. So they can both access both systems and further, the conceptual and sensory systems are really tightly integrated. There isn't any dividing line where you can say everything above here is the concept and everything below here is the sensory system. It's a really continuum of going from visual information to li detecting lines, that's a concept, to detecting areas, that's a concept, to detecting objects, that's a concept. So there's, there's concepts all the way up from the raw visual data up to the highest level concept that we have, which is I, me, my. I claim that the experiencer is the only source of both the conceptual and sensory worlds that are used by the thinker and the doer. You could imagine that there were two duplicate systems that work for each agent, but that would be a silly waste of resources. There's one system that creates the model and it gives it to both agents. So now I'm gonna give you an actual example of a dual process theory question. So the question would be to say, would say, read this description of Linda, and then I'm gonna give you eight choices, and I'm going to ask you to rank them in order from uh, most probable to least probable. Now, I'm only going to give you three statements because we can't do eight easily in this room here. So um, the three statements, I'm going to actually ask you to answer this question, and I'm going to ask you to answer it by e raising either your right hand, your left hand, or both hands if you think the, answers, the correct answer is either one, two, or three that I'm going to show you right now. So get ready, set, go. As soon as you're ready, raise your hand, one, two, or three. 
Okay, not everybody's raising their hand. Okay. All right, everybody who's raising one hand, lower your hand. And there, the people, there were some people that answered two hands. Well, the correct answer is either one or two. And the answer key is that the thinker is the one that comes up with one or two. I mean, you can't decide whether it's Linda's more likely to be a feminist or a bank teller, but she could be either one of those. But the thinker knows for sure that uh, it's not more probable that, they, that Linda is both a bank teller and a feminist. And the way the thinker knows that is by doing something like a Venn diagram like this. You know, the, the intersection of these two circles is less than either circle alone, so that has to be the least probable answer. Now, the problem is the doer doesn't understand the concept of probability. And so the doer can't answer that question that's asked, but instead it can answer a question like this. Which statements matches more of the categories mentioned in the description? And this third statement matches more of the categories. In fact, if you change that and in that statement to an or, the doer has the right answer. The doer answered that question with an or instead of that question with an and. And in fact, Kahneman calls this the conjunction fallacy because they, the fallacy because the doer didn't understand that anding two things together gives you a less probable result. Now, if you did answer uh, number three, don't worry. The great majority of every group that was tested, I mean, they tested this experiment extensively, a lot of replications of this experiment. In every case, a majority of the people answered three. Now, this is where they had not just three choices, but they had eight choices. So it's much easier to ignore the connections between these different answers when there are other uh, answers in between the three, in between these three answers. They only cared about those three answers and the relative ranking of those three answers. But um, a majority of people gave the wrong answer here. In fact, Stanford Business School graduate students, 85 of them percent gave the wrong answer. And these are people that supposedly know about all this stuff, probability, decision making, statistics. I like, uh, uh, in a review of this experiment by uh, Stephen Jay Gruhl, he wrote, I am particularly fond of this example because I know that the third statement is least probable, yet a little homunculus in my head continues to jump up and down shouting at me, but she can't just be a bank teller, read the description. You know, that homunculus knows the, the, it's, he's right, the doer knows he's got the right answer and he's trying to convince the thinker that he's got the right answer. In uh, 2006, there was an international conference on dual process theory, and that led to a 2009 book, and I'm going to read a quote from uh, chapter two of that book. It would be more useful to describe this grand unifying form of dual process th theory as the two minds hypothesis. Here I define mind as a high level cognitive system capable of representing the external world and acting upon it in order to serve the goals of the organism. So I'll stop right there. You notice that the mind that he's describing here is an agent. It has goals, it can represent the world, and it can act to achieve those goals in the world. So he's defining a mind as an agent. The quote goes on and says, the two mind hypothesis is that the human brain contains not one, but two parallel systems for doing this. Animals, according to this view, have but one system corresponding to the old mind in human beings. Humans have a new mind which coexists in uneasy coalition with the first, sometimes coming into direct conflict with it. So this uneasy coalition and direct conflict, that's part of the living problem that spirituality solves. He goes on and says, this is a strong, even startling hypothesis, which makes it very interesting, if probably wrong. So I hope that this presentation will make you think that this is more probably right than wrong, because I basically have this two mind hypothesis.